Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Little Things or Big Things Education podcast. Coming up this week with our big idea of flexibility with our individual students, we're going to talk to you about like a number of different things that could show up and how we need to remain flexible so we keep that ultimate goal of keeping doors open for them. Uh, we'll talk about how to make sure that we're addressing some of the sleep needs and some insomnia and other reasons why maybe they're losing sleep. Talk about mental health, uh, as well as just the ridiculous workload a lot of our students are taking on, uh, both academically as well as extracurricular. And Dave's gonna uh, close us out with a really good story time talking about not closing that door, having those real deadlines at the final and allowing students the opportunity to keep that door open. May not always work, but it's always good to hear a good success story. So let's get to do it. Yeah. All right, folks, welcome back to Little Things or Big Things Education. He is coming to you live from Bowling Green, Kentucky, with the same energy of all of his four golden retrievers wrapped into his one body. He's got seven years teaching math, three years working with Challenge Day, and tutoring one-on-one -on -one through it all. My best friend and their awesome teacher, T-Free. What up, everybody? You know k coming to you from the soggy PNW. How is the weather out there? It's actually 80 degrees today, man. Gorgeous. Love it. Uh, he's got the whistle around his neck all the time because he's got 11 years of social studies, 20 years of coaching, and uh, he's my best bud. Fantastic teacher, K-Dub. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for listening to Little Big Things. Little Things are Big Things Education. We are brought to you by Peak Stake Mathematics. Please do not forget to rate and review us. We would love to hear from you at littlebiged.com. Please give us those five stars. We are continuing to get better and grow and hoping that our grades reflect that. So uh, what's first today, Tim? Uh, we're going to get kickstarted back into our big idea about flexibility with our students' needs uh, and their different situations. And as promised from kind of that teaser at the end of Tuesday's episode, we, we're going to start to talk about like how important it is to really get flexible and adapt to all the variability that can come to us with our students, right? And um uh, we played around with some improv as just teachers and kind of rolling with the flow. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we're adaptable in our like individual plans. And like, obviously part of our connection is getting to know our students and figure out their individual needs. Um, and like Dave said perfectly the other week is like our goal really at the end of this all when they graduate high school um, and that's you know our goal is to make sure they graduate and they have as many doors open uh, as possible we don't want to be closing those those doors on them so how can we be flexible how can we teach them good life lessons and get us there so we're going to talk about a bunch of different things but that's kind of our big idea today yeah and i think i think the one thing to connect to with all of that i mean i know the whole podcast is really about the power of relationships and being connected with your students but this is one of the pillars of why that is so important. Because if you don't have those connections and those relationships that we've hopefully given you some ideas on how to how to how to build or, or how to or some new ideas on how to establish those, this is the why those things are important from a very practical standpoint. So I think that the relationships and that connection are valuable in and of themselves. And from an academic helping your students stay motivated to build off of last week's podcast theme and or to get them across the finish line, uh, knowing what's going on with them is what's going to allow you to be flexible to whatever situation that student happens to be facing that day, that week, that semester, whatever, you know, whatever you're facing in that moment when you're working with a kid. Right. Uh, I think one of the things that has been almost more prevalent in my class this year with all the weirdness that's been going on is like sleep deprivation and just <laughs> like how many kids I swear are falling asleep in my class every day. And uh, you guys have been with us long enough that you know that if you're falling asleep in my class, it's not because it's a boring, quiet classroom, right? Like, that kid's like falling asleep in my class with disco ball lights, music, multiple conversations, like the wheels spinning and all over the place and like trying to get people up on the board, like, and they're still like out cold. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this has been a, a, a challenge for me. And I, I try not to take it personal. Um, and I think that's <laughs> one, of the, one of the first parts is like, 
there's got to be something going on, right? And so I've got to have the conversations. I've got to get to know the student, like what's going on? Why are we falling asleep? And, the, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for that and trying to figure out like, all right, you know, how do I make sure you are able to be set up for success if this is the only place you're getting sleep for whatever reason? Um, and like, you know, like, how can we keep you awake in class more often? <laughs> so <laughs> trying to work out some life skills, but um, I don't know. That's been an interesting one. Uh, Dave, have you noticed that at all this year? And I know you guys are a little more virtual than in person. So maybe yeah, it's, we're, it's we're just going back to hybrid on what we're starting. I shouldn't say going back. Uh, we're starting hybrid on Monday. So I have not seen any of my students in person yet this year. Um, but I think that has its own causes. Uh, you know, I, I talked in a previous podcast about one of my students who had shared that they were dealing with some insomnia issues. Uh, I know that that all of it wasn't related to just the added screen time, right? Like you're you're asking these kids to, I mean, all of us, to be honest, to be on our screens for hours on end. And we know before the pandemic even started, we knew that looking at a cell phone screen or computer screen right before you went to bed was just a bad idea, right? That blue light or whatever the, the terminology is. So yeah, I've definitely seen it with my students. I think another part of it that I've, uh, speaking of being flexible, is right like the the application that we use for school is called canvas and there's some things about it that are great there's some things that are a little wonky um but it one of the things it does is it, it asks you i think you can ignore it but it asks you to put a time that you want an assignment to be due and it has a specific time and i've just started leaving it blank and what i tell my kids is before you go to bed so I, like whether that's four o'clock in the morning and you're working on it from two to four or whatever. Here's the deal. I'm going to be up at six. And one of the first things I'm going to do is check to turn like, you know, after I've had a cup of coffee, I'm going to see who's turned in their work. And I think just being flexible in that little way of we don't have the normal structure. So kids are going to be working at things at different times. And the insomnia part of that is a, a quick connection to just like we're on our screens all the time. So kids are having a hard time falling asleep. Right. No, I totally agree with you there. And <clears throat> Uh, gosh, it like I love technology, right? <laughs> and I a hundred percent like get and acknowledge that it is an addiction at the exact same time. Oh yeah. And so it's easy for us to numb out. It's easy for us to be distracted. It's easy for us to have so many things going on at once that our brain literally is triggering like dopamine all the time with dings, mm -hmm. and vibrations, and bells, and pop up ads, and <clears throat> even if you're in the class, like in my classroom, we try really, really hard to have them on their Chromebooks just doing what's the assignment. Like we've got like the Impero or whatever it's called that we can see the students work that's up and like my co-teachers over there just closing people's tabs like, <laughs> no get off of whatever game or whatever yeah. youtube video like they're watching like soccer games live while they're trying to do their homework and it's like they're going split screen and there's always multiple things going and like yeah of course you can't sleep your brain has been like split attention for the last eight hours while you're at school and then you go home and you're trying to like unwind and decompress and just be with yourself um, and so I think having the flexibility, like you said, just with the due dates and be like, yo, like just make sure it's done before you go to bed and like, I'll check it when I get up. I think that's <laughs> good. Like, flexibility and due dates. Um, for me, the flexibility in when they learn is something I've tried to be really diligent mm. about. And so that's like, Hey, like if you're going to fall asleep right now, you got to promise me that you're going to go home and watch this 20 minute video, right? Like. Mm. This is me in class teaching like because I record a lot of my classes live and then I just post those. Um, sometimes they're full classes and I, I think those are less effective. Like if it's like a 45, 50 minute video versus when I go back at the end, I'm like, hey, this is what we learned on Monday and Tuesday in like 15 minutes. I think okay. those are more impactful, <clears throat> but those take more time. Right. So I don't do them all, all the time just because of my schedule. But trying to get the students to always have the option to learn from a video if they're not going to be physically present or mentally present in my class for a, a number of reasons sleep being one of them has been a big one for me this year like six period the sun's been coming out you know the classroom's starting to get warm the kids are worn out and they start fading out um especially because we were about what two 
three weeks now. I think we had about two weeks before spring break, and now we're the first week after spring break where we're back literally five days a week. Mm -hmm. And that has been an adjustment and an endurance thing, really, for the students to be in school for 37 hours a week. Yeah, that would be a shift for a lot of kids around the country. I mean, I think the other thing about being flexible to the sleep situation, uh, I like how you talked about multiple reasons that it could a kid could be wanting to sleep in your class, not because they're bored with your class, but because of mm-hmm. outside factors. And I really appreciated that you didn't like pinpoint something or try and stereotype based on a student. I know one of the things that I've mentioned in passing before is that there's a an idea around scheduling too, that it would be really helpful if students didn't always see their teacher at the same time. So if they are having that issue that maybe you see that per, that person first period one day, but you see them at the end of the day, another day and so they would they would have the ability to maybe they've caught up but the i think the first thing that you said when it came to the kid who's sleeping is the most important thing don't take it personal and then figure out like what's going on you're in a different position than a lot of us i think a lot of us would have to have that first step of introspection like what can i do in my class <clears throat> to make sure that they're not falling asleep because they're bored or or things are dry, or whatever, right? Like if I don't I don't do this as much, but if I was like a classic social studies teacher who just got up in front of the podium and talked for an hour every day, that would be I should actually take that personal and think about why the student is falling asleep in my class. Unless you're, not you're in the, a phenomenal storyteller. That's true. Okay. The, the, the One of my favorite catalogs. social studies classes ever was in college. This dude was the greatest storyteller ever. 90 minutes. I could not stop writing notes. <laughs> and we had one of those at Bothell, actually. I don't know if you ever had Mr. Hill, but he was like that at Bothell. He, he would talk nonstop. I mean, even about art, which I'm not even that. I wasn't into before I took his class. But um, so, I mean, yes, g- good job catching that it's not always tr- true that the, the lecture is not going to be entertaining. But I, I just think the fact that, like, you are lucky, not lucky, you've worked hard enough to be in a place where you know that the reason that the kid's falling asleep isn't because your, your class isn't engaging and that there's nothing – to provide that kid with the boost to, to try and stay engaged or something else going on, but to then not take it personal and get mad, like, man, I'm doing this, I'm playing music, I'm doing, and I'm like, be angry at the kid. Instead, going, okay, this kid's dealing with this. What, what are some things that could be the reason behind that? And then that flexibility piece that you mentioned where like, okay, dude, if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna be able to be awake during my class, I'm not gonna yell at you, I'm not gonna kick you out, I'm not gonna whatever, I'm just gonna make an agreement with you that these videos are available. Here's where the videos are. You've got to do this at a time uh, that that fits your schedule because clearly my class doesn't fit your schedule right now. Right, <clears throat> right. And uh, I mean, so many of these things, right, that we got to be flexible with. I think the, the next one, and this is big also this year, mental health, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, even this week, had a student where the start of class, um, you know, and I've gotten, I've gotten to know this student pretty well over the course of the year and have started to learn some of the the chaos and variability of home life and things like that Mm -hmm. they're like yo Frederick, can i just go work on the common space today and i was like yeah like i you know i've I've worked with her before i already kind of we already have some of these guidelines and setups um, that we've already built in structure and you know i'm like yeah just you know you you know the videos are built into the form check it out i'm gonna get the class rolling i'll keep coming out i'll pop in i'll check you're gonna ask me questions things like that and so like you know to a certain degree i'm almost holding class in two classrooms at the same time <laughs> um part of that is i've gotten really comfortable with that this year because our new building we're working in i teach in literally four different like classrooms we like we go from classroom to classroom as teachers this year um and so i'm comfortable with relocating and teaching from any space um and again that goes with some of the improv we did on tuesday is just you know just learn how to always say yes and and what's next like what's my next best step Mm -hmm. Uh, and just go with it so you know i i was ready for that student to go out and do some individual learning um just because of the situation but then you know you also get to ask that one deeper question are you actually okay and like Mm. A lot of times that's the first time somebody's checked in with that student all day and you've hopefully you've taken the time all year to build the trust and all of a sudden like boom like guard drops like like she's like on the verge of just like emotional collapse because there's mm-hmm. so 
much going on and she always keeps a tough front mm -hmm. uh, she's a tough kid and she's had to be and um you know i'm like no like like we're, we're gonna actually stop for a moment they'll be okay like i know my students have enough going on and they can work independently they know what's coming up next like i've set up my class structure to operate without me if needed and so i'm gonna be here and we're gonna deal with it and then you mm -hmm. know try to out the best solution so in that situation you know i made sure that we got her down to the counselor because it was at that point where we needed to have that intervention and start to work with the team and all that collaboration that we've talked about um, as well like all the pieces start to come together um, and we make sure that the best learning can happen for that student and you know she's been gone for a, a few days at this point and i know that when she gets back we're gonna have to very specifically check back in make sure the mental health part's taken care of because that's number mm -hmm. one and then two how can i make sure i get you caught back up so you don't feel overwhelmed and re-trigger something and two i want to make sure that you know your learnings equally as important and i'm going to get you there so the the never give up concepts right yeah and i think a couple things come to mind hearing you tell that story the the, the first is an appreciation for your stopping and focusing on the first part of what the student said, which was that like, I'm struggling right now. And even though the student tried to like then move to the second thing very quickly, the fact that you like pulled, pulled them back, I had a, a somewhat similar experience by email, again, we're remote still, of like student sharing something that was difficult and then asking how to make up the work that they missed from this, like the original thing being difficult. And, you know, the student had, had shared this with all four of his teachers. And, and I'm not saying this to, to make myself sound great. It's, it's more of a reminder to all of us that this is really important. Is my first email, I didn't even address the work that the student was asking about making up. I just checked in about, I'm sorry about what happened. Are you getting what you need? How are you feeling? Um, and then a quick thing about, like, if you do want to still, if, you're, if you are ready to do the work, let me know. If you're not, that's okay. We can you know, we can figure it out at another point in time. And then they responded and, and were very thankful that I'd done the first thing and literally pointed out, I emailed all four of my teachers uh, at the same time. I've heard back from everybody. You're the only person that like, didn't just go straight to, here's the work that you need to do. Um, so I appreciate you doing that. And I think that's something that we all just need to remind ourselves of, especially when the kids are the ones who are trying to give us permission or the path into moving on to the next thing because that also drives disconnection right like that idea that we're not sitting with the hard thing first mm -hmm. is is really important um and then the flexibility piece to that what that reminds me of uh you, you mentioned something about last week and the yes and principle and the motivation principle i was thinking about you know we we talk about how it's become really common and i think it's something that happens I think it's a universal thing that's always been there is that people always complain about kids these days. Right. And right. there's like, there's this assumption that there's like this lack of mental toughness or that there's more anxiety than ever or more stress than, than, than before. And that kids don't have the toughness to move through this. And this is one of a couple of places today in, in the flexibility conversation where I wanted to remind people that like, first of all, they are products of the environments that we have created for them. Like that's number one. So if they are more entitled or if they're more lazy or if they are less mentally tough than you were growing up because you were so awesome, then think about what you did to create that circumstance or what our society has done to create that circumstance. In the case of, of, of mental health, I think the more appropriate thing to really focus on though is for a long time, it wasn't okay to share or to talk about what was difficult in our lives and we are finally getting to a place where that is okay and i think that's a good thing and as teachers our job in that is not to solve it right like i'm not going to help a kid overcome losing a family member or um an anxiety around speaking in public right like that's not my job we have counselors and um school psychiatrists whose job it is is to take care of like actually solving isn't the right word but helping on the mental health front my job is to be flexible and when that student is feeling in the appropriate headspace to show up and learn, to be ready for them and to not have any judgment on why they weren't here before, but just to celebrate they're here now, we're going to learn now and not worry about getting upset that they're not on the same timetable that we want them to be on. 
Yeah, I <clears throat> I love the bring back to the timetable piece too, because like everything we're talking about, it it keeps like throwing this like reminder to me that's like, oh my gosh, like I I used to be and I try really hard not to be anymore, so rigid. Like I was like, no, this is how it's supposed to be, right? And the more <laughs> expectation I put on how my classroom should be, how my students should behave, how my lesson should go how the test performance and outcome should be because we did this lesson and then we did this follow-up and we did that exit slip and I worked one-on-one -on -one with this kid. I know they're going to be successful and then it just went all to crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, well, now what? <laughs> and the more I've gotten away from the idea of my – my expectation of what life needs to look like <laughs> and and what it actually is the more i've be, become a better teacher the more i've gotten rid of expectations right i still have mm -hmm. high standards and this is yeah. what i'm i'm going to put out there but i also have shifted my expectation to this is more than likely not going to work as planned and i'm going to have to make an adjustment like that's that's my new like go to is what am I going to be able to do to overcome the hurdle or the misstep or whatever's going to come up? Like I game plan ahead of time that this could happen, this could happen. And not like a, like the, the sky is falling, worst case scenario, fallout, like, oh my gosh, I'm pessimistic about everything. But it's, I'm hopeful this is my outcome. And when this happens, I know how to react to it and how to roll with it. Mm -hmm. That is something that I am also kind of struggling through how to, how to get better with. Um, I, I do think that being a social studies teacher, it's a little bit easier because like my state standards, there's technically content <laughs> stuff, but there's already so much content. Like when they say world history and they tell you from 1400 to present and they haven't adjusted that for 50 years, it's like, uh, you know, stuff has happened in the last 50 years that we might need to talk about. Um, or the, there's more stories to tell because we're not just telling the old white guy version of the story anymore. Um, that said, we have like this permission that at least at our school where like, we don't put things in the grade bit, grade book based on content and skills, right? Like we're working on speaking and listening. We're looking, we're working on critical reading. We're working on using evidence to support a, to, to support a claim. And when you rephrase what your focus on learning is, it also makes it much easier. Or at least for me, it's been much easier to worry less about when the student is walking into the door ready to learn, because particularly for using like proficiency grades for standards-based grading, you're also, what you're looking for is can the student show the ability to do that skill at that grade level, right? Or at that whatever level. And then once they do that, your job, if you're really pushing kids to the next level is, okay, you've done it once at this level. Now I'm gonna like, I'm gonna push you a little bit further and say, hey, now I want you to do it this way, right? I wanna add this layer of complexity or difficulty or independence or or maybe sometimes doing it with somebody else makes it harder right but um having that part of it i think really helps detach that's like a strategy for detaching yourself or at least for me it's been a strategy for detaching myself from really having like this strict adherence that it has to go this way yeah for sure um one of the other things that that we talked about last week that i think is really pertinent to this flexibility conversation that's really more about the students is the idea of, and I think you brought it up in the connection activity on Tuesday as well, is the idea of keeping doors open, right? right. Like the, our job and the student's job is you walk, <laughs> you walk into doors in high school depending on, you know, whatever privileges you're walking in with that are out of your control, right? You have a certain number of doors that are open to you. Um, and your job is to, to finish with all of those doors still open. And the reason I think that's really important is that, and the thing I loved about our improv activity that I want to think about how to incorporate more in my classroom uh, is the idea that students also need to be flexible to changing interests, right? Like I thought I really wanted to be a doctor and then I realized I don't really like looking at people who have been cut open, right? Like that is actually grossing me out. I don't want to be a doctor anymore. If you've put all of your eggs into that basket and you've actually closed other doors because you were so focused on the one goal, or the one option that you thought you wanted to pursue, you're kind of hosed when it comes time to maybe pivot and make a different decision. And so I think that's another thing where flexibility for our students is really important too, right? Like giving our students 
some lessons on being flexible enough with their own interest that it's okay to like change course. Well, and I think as teachers and coaches and parents, <clears throat> we need to also keep that in mind because I think this specialization at age mm. seven, <laughs> definitely by <laughs> age 12, right? Like the, you can't be a multi-sport athlete anymore because in order to play one sport, it requires a full-time job commitment year round. Mm -hmm. and, is wild and i think it adds to some of the stress and the overcommitments and that that atmosphere we have created for why these students are like yeah i didn't sleep last night because i played you know back-to-back doubleheader baseball game um <clears throat> with a hour rain delay we finished at 11 o'clock i was home by midnight i then took a shower and then i tried to do your homework until two three in the morning and now i'm supposed to be at school at 7 30 you know, AM, like, yeah, of course I'm going to sleep in your class <laughs> or, or I didn't do your homework, you know, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Or I didn't do the homework. And I, I think like, there's two things about that that immediately pop into my mind that I can already picture some of the teachers who think that athletics are a distraction and they're going to be like, well, they shouldn't be doing that in the first place. That student might not, we talked about this last week with motivation. That student might not give a rip about your class if they don't have the, whatever the co-curricular is, whether it's cause like our school, we have a, banging drama department right like we put on some freaking amazing performances but the kids are also there late working on stuff yes. and so like again if the kids don't get to, if people don't get to pursue their passions then they're not going to do the checkbox stuff right like i'm into drama but i have to go to this economics class they have to go if they know that they can't do the thing that they're passionate about if they don't check the box on the economics then they'll they'll do what they need to to check that box if if they don't have the thing that they're passionate about, they're probably not even going to bother. So I want to just like push that argument off to the side that like, Oh, they shouldn't be up late <laughs> doing the co-curriculars. That's nonsense. And then the, the, the second piece to what you spoke about with the specialization, I said there were a couple places where I wanted to talk about disagreeing with the premise that kids in, in the modern, um, in the modern day kids these days are lazy or entitled or whatever. Like you think about, we talked about this a little bit before the podcast, and I think it's a good note to bring up how much time we spent on football, like what the what the time commitment was expected to be uh, in 2002 versus what it is today, which I know very, you know, I'm very well aware of that. I'm a, I'm a coach in 2020, and it's very hard sometimes when you're building the schedule to be like keeping up with the Joneses and realizing that, man, we're asking a lot of our players right now. And and I think when we're that well, we're has not like, even we're we're demanding, right? Really, it's not really, hey, really you, should come to practice, you should come to work out, or you should come to this, you know, extra rehearsal, or you should come help with set design. It's no, you come to this, or you're not part of this. Like it's a demand. It's not an ask. Yeah, that's a really good point, and it's funny. Like as you say that, the other thing that I think about is it's it's a demand of the kid that's probably on the on the outlier sides of it right it's a demand on the part of the kid who's least likely to benefit from it so i'm thinking of let's take two kids for example from our school and i'm going to use names and i hope they don't care we are really good friends with brian wood right he did not play a whole lot he was right. partially there because like all of us were there as friends like our friend group of 10 or 12 people we all played on the football team and so he was there partially because if he wanted to hang out with us that's where we were Right. But the other part of it was like he wasn't being pushed to a point where he felt like he couldn't be on the team if he wasn't lifting weights at five o'clock in the morning, January through June, right? Like that was not an expectation at that time. That's uh, that's an expectation at a lot of places, especially as academic periods are getting taken away and the, like all sorts of other tangential things to talk about. So would he have continued through that because he's not going to see the field anymore if he shows up? at the weight room, right? Like it's, he's not going to get enough out of that to like vault his athleticism to the point that he was going to pass you on the depth chart like that. That wasn't going to happen. Right. Probably. And then on the flip side, let's say Justin Hughes decides not to show up to the weight room January through June. Um, but he shows up in August or he shows up in June. He's still the fastest kid on the team. He's right. still six foot three. Uh, you know, still he can gamer. He still got hands the size of a football helmet, right? Like, guess who's still going to play? Guess who's still going to be on the team? The kid that didn't make the commitment. I, I, there are a few coaches far and in between that will actually tell that kid to kick rocks. But, like, most <clears throat> coaches are going to let that kid continue to play. And so 
I think when we're talking about our students these days being lazy or having that sense of entitlement, I think understanding the level of commitment that comes with m participating in modern day co-curriculars, like the idea like specialization of it is a really important thing for all of us to be aware of. And who, like the adults are very clearly the ones who are responsible for that. And there's also a connection to our mental health with that. I don't know if you're seeing this as much as I am. You know, we teach in very different communities right now. But at our school, a lot of the parents, and to some extent, I think it's hard to, it's very hard to know chicken and egg, right? Whether it's from the student or from, from the, the parent who are playing the sport because they actively think that it's going to get them into college. Right. Like, and or like even pay for, for a paycheck, basically. Yeah, like, and or actually going to pay for college. And I think back to like our time on our football team. I don't, I know I really wanted to play college football and I wasn't really thinking about the fact that I was five foot nine and 160 pounds. Like that wasn't going to happen. Um, Cause I did not run a four one forty. Um, but I don't think a lot of guys on our team are really thinking about playing at the next level. Right. Like, and, and so you add that added stress or pressure on top of the sports commitment. Now you're creating a mental health issue on top of that. So like, yeah, it's no wonder that, kids these days are having a harder time balancing the workload and might come across as lazy or like they're quicker to drop a commitment, but that's because the commitment that we're asking for, like the entry level commitment that we're asking for is absurd compared to the entry level commitment that we were asking for 20 years ago. Right. And as you were speaking, I was like feverishly over here, like looking up a statistic so I could give some actual accurate answers here. Beautiful. Uh, cause I, cause we're, you know, we talk about, I think the co-curriculars, we talk about, you know, the drama department, we talk about our athletics, because you and I, obviously, that was important with us. And it, we, we know it really well. <clears throat> but the other thing that I start to think about, too, is how many of my students, if we say strictly academic right now, we don't even look at athletics, mm -hmm. strictly academic, how many of our students now are almost expected to take three, four, five AP classes all at once? <laughs> Who does that? And why? Right. And it's because, oh, well, college is so difficult to get into. So I need more AP classes to set me aside. Oh, well, you know, everybody's doing six AP classes now. So I got to go volunteer and I got to get my, my honor society credits. And, oh, well, you know, they also like a well-rounded kid. So I can't just be really academic and really smart. I got to go join the, the sports team as the JV all-star, you know, and, and ride the pine and do my time. And it's like, like if you, I was in the stat I was looking up was AP typically assigns 45 minutes to an hour and a half per night of homework. And, and I, I, be, I believe that. Like I've, I've talked to some of my, like I've got a, a student that was on my volleyball team who one of our top performers got like a great, I'm not very familiar with ACT because we were SATs, but I think yeah. uh, it's like out of 38 or 40 or something. Right. And she had like, two points off of the highest score. Like she's a okay. brilliant kid. She's in four or five AP classes. She's a starter on the volleyball team. Like she's nuts. And I'm like, if she if she's literally doing school from let's say 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Let's just mm -hmm. round up right there. She's got seven hours a day of school. Yep. She's got four or five AP classes that are giving her four or five hours of homework. But let's just call it three hours of homework. Let's be nice on it. A mm. night. And then she's got three hours of volleyball. Plus, because she's a good teammate, she's going to the freshman game. She's going to the JV game. She's supporting. So she's doing her homework in the stands while supporting her classmates. She, I, uh, no joke, in season, I've, I've watched this student get to school at 730 to get a little extra support when she doesn't know what she's doing. Go through a you know 3 p.m stay after school to get a little extra help because she want to make sure she's doing the right thing go home basically to check in with mom and dad drop off a book bag get back to the school by 5 p.m and does not leave till 10 p.m when we're cleaning up the gym that's the most insane schedule like ever like if you made a teacher work nine hours consistently a day we lose our minds most of us do it right like really good teachers we're putting in 45 hour weeks, easy, right? Easy. Yeah. I would say. Easy, right. Even 10 hour. <laughs> day. But a 10 hour day is 7 PM to 5 PM. Like this kid is doing 7 PM to 10 PM. 
like a 15 hour day in season on a regular basis so they can get into school. Like, like I burn out and I'm crazy and I burn out <laughs> when I'm putting in 12 hour, 13, 14 hour days consistently. Like you've worked the fireworks stand with me. We do yeah. 13, 14 hour days. And at the end of those eight days, like I'm, I'm a, like nutty. I'm losing my mind. And these <laughs> kids are doing four AP classes and trying to do all their extracurriculars all at the same time. Like, yeah, of course we're putting this insane demand on people. Like, well, we one have of the, to be flexible with that. One of the things that's funny when you brought up like the number of AP classes, I remember actively getting hollered at by one of the counselors in our building. So we, first of all, we do something that's different at our in our district. And I think it's really a statewide Oregon thing. We offer eight classes a semester. Okay. for a year and the idea behind that is that it creates space that if you fail a class it's very easy to get the credit recovery in without like having to come to outside school time stuff but what that also sets up is that you could literally get all of the credits that you need to graduate if it weren't for the fact that two of the classes are you can't take until you're a senior you can graduate as a junior right you're basically taking a whole extra year of classes so we have these eight period schedules and I had students that were signing up for four or five AP classes and I was seeing the impacts of that my first two years in the building. So then when we started doing these things where uh, every year we ask our students, like we put out like, here's all the courses, we do this whole fair uh, during one of our, um, essentially instead of an assembly where students can come and like walk around and check out all the electives that are being offered and, and whatnot. And then we have these parent conferences to help students. These are all great things to help students and parents think about what courses they want to forecast for. And I was shocking parents when I was like, and kids when I was like, do not take four AP classes next year. That is stupid. Yeah. What you should do is take one or two, do really well with them and then take one or two the next year, right? Like don't take, cause you're going to run out of options. If you're taking, if you take a bunch, your sophomore year and a bunch of junior. And some of this was like kids actively trying to like rig the schedule so that they would have a really, really hard junior year and then have like a, a basically like a, an easy senior year. But I'd also seen kind of my final kick over the head with that was I had a football player who did do that, right? Like took all the really hard courses AP, who basically only had to come to school every other day as a, as a senior, then got told he wasn't allowed to play sports if he did that, changed his schedule so he was only coming in the afternoons, whatever. He didn't get into some of the schools that he thought he was going to get into. And they actively told him, like, we didn't like that you took your senior year off. Mm. And so I started telling my students, like, first of all, here's this story of why you don't want to, like, create an easy schedule for yourself for senior year, but also you're going to do better. Your mental health is going to be better if you you lighten up. And I had someone from the career center and someone from the counseling center, like, write me these just like, I can't believe you would tell anybody that. Like, that's that's not what we should be telling kids. Like, they need to take as many AP classes as they can as soon as they can. And I was like, hey, you're just wrong. Um, right. So but, and you, you have the people who argue that, oh, well, now you're destroying my kids' college chances, right? Like it's – Well, that was the thing, though. The, and, and, I mean, again, this is very anecdotal, right? This is three years of talking to however many students I've had. And, you know, there's only a certain percentage that are, like, making that, like, crazy push to try and do that. But all of the parents who heard that, like, you could see the stress just roll off their shoulders. And you could see the students just, like, looking at parents hoping that this plan was going to get approved. Because, like, even thinking about it, it's daunting. Yeah. And so it's like now I teach ninth graders. I'm like, you know what? Your sophomore year, take one AP class. See how it goes. And make sure you take it in something that you care about. If you don't like social studies, don't take an AP social studies class. Right? If you really like science, take AP whatever. Right? Take AP biology. Do that. Figure out how that goes. Because, right. and if it goes well, then try something else. Right? Continue to expand and push yourself. But like the idea of, of doing too much is something that I think it's funny that we keep calling kids these days lazy when you think about the amount of effort and work that is going into co-curriculars and school at this point in time in terms of like what the kind of baseline expectation is it's way higher than it was or at least than what i remember it being when i was 16. right and i'd i'd almost argue to say and this happens in a lot of things in our our world right and some of the systematic stuff that's been designed is i think we're getting more extremes mm -hmm. i think because those standards and expectations are up. Our high achievers are being pushed harder than they've ever been pushed. Mm -hmm. And I think, like you said, sometimes we have those people that are like, why would I go to 7 a.m. weight room for six months out of the year knowing I'm not going to get extra play time? 
put in mm -hmm. the same amount of time and effort. And so they've just kind of given up. And I think that's mm -hmm. where we start to think about, oh, they're lazy, right? And it's like, no, you've made the barrier to entry so high. Yeah. Why would I even try? And then you tell them they're lazy and you write this story and then they hear <laughs> the story and then we tell the story. And, you know, there's that, that spiral effect that's going on there. But, yeah, I think the biggest thing, though, that I kind of want to leave with before we get you into story time is this idea of, like, <clears throat> keep the doors open, mm -hmm. never give up, and whatever is going on in their life, we can help them be successful. And it, I, I believe as a teacher, it's on me to find that solution because there's already so much on their plate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I try to be as creative as I can. And sometimes I'm good at it and sometimes I'm not. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an improvisation and it's, uh, it's a game. And the more I think we have fun with it and the more we try stuff and fail and learn from it, I think, the the better we can show up to help these students have their their future as wide open as we can possibly make it for them so awesome all right folks quick interruption before i get into story time to plug littlebigedcom as a reminder to check out all the free resources that we have on there last week tim shared a really great resource with understanding how much money a student actually makes for showing up to class in their future lives, paying your future self is a term that I know he uses a lot in his classroom. And this week he's sharing another really cool resource with us. For those of you that listen to the Tuesday podcast, um, some prompts and ideas and even some videos on improv as a way to develop flexibility amongst your staff and or amongst your students. So again, littlebigedcom please go ahead and visit us and give us any reviews you have as well. And now back to story time. I think I 100% agree with everything you just said. And I'm going to use story time to kind of build on all of that. Uh, I, I will say, as I get into my story time here, that if I am honestly reflecting on who I am as a teacher, I think being flexible has certainly become my greatest strength. And it, it might have always been my greatest strength. And I, I do think we always need to be aware that oftentimes our greatest strength is also like our greatest weakness, right? Like there's fears of how rigorous am I being if I'm always being this flexible and, you know, things of that nature. And I have a really good story from very recently. I'm not going to use any names, obviously, uh, of a student who, so we, like I said, we are in remote learning. And we've been in remote learning all year. You know, it's it's been literally more than... 12 months since we left the classroom and we have not been back in the classroom with our students, right? That was last March. It's April now. It's been, you know, a, a year and a couple of weeks. So we had quarter grades uh, because we're doing all the stuff that I've talked about in the past where we've taken semesters and cut them in half and, and all this stuff. So quarter three is eight weeks long. It's the first time I've met this group of students. I don't know these kids from Kane and um, starting off with them and trying to get through a whole semester of, of modern world history together. At one point, just like as a piece of anecdotal evidence of something that I, you know, it's anecdotal evidence for me, but I, when I reached out to people nationwide who are coaches and teachers or just building wide, um, I don't feel like it was, it wasn't just me. 30, at one point during quarter three, 30% of my students had a failing grade in my class. And to, to fail my class means that you're not showing up and you're not doing work. That's what that means. Um, so usually I have like one or two kids a, a class that are failing at the end of the, you know, when it actually comes time to turn grades in. So this is like a really high thing and I'm trying to do some reflection and try and figure some things out. And I'm really just noticing like our kids have hit a wall, right? Like being remote, the, the motivation has, has dipped dramatically and trying to think about, usually I'm very flexible on due dates, but there's still like a, hey, when we come back from spring break, I'm not taking anything from before spring break anymore because that's just like, that's too that's from too long ago. And some of that is is just like, I don't want you to try and make up 24 assignments in two weeks. Like I'm trying to like force you to get a couple things done so that we can get to the next procrastination time period <laughs> and, and whatnot. Like I, I love this new word for procrastination that one of our teachers came up with, with is being deadline oriented mm -hmm. um, versus being a procrastinator. But I had a student who emailed me, the quarter ended last Thursday. I had a student who emailed me the Friday before that, had only attended, I went back and looked at the attendance, something like 20% of the classes and pretty much all of those were like in the first two or three weeks. Um, 
So I hadn't been to class in basically a month. Hadn't turned in an assignment in six weeks. And they email me with the, hey, Mr. K-Dub, sorry I've been away. I just have not been, I've been having a really hard time getting out of bed. Just, I'm, I haven't had any motivation to do any schoolwork. Uh, I don't really know why, but I just, I, I haven't been feeling motivated. So again, first thing, like, hey, I'm glad that you're motivated and whatnot. But it took me a really long time to get to that point. I, I did not respond to that email in the moment because I recognized, thankfully, that my initial response was inappropriate. Because my initial response is, I didn't get to the end of the email. The end of the email was, what do I need to do to get an A in your class this quarter? <laughs> and so I can tell by your laughter that, you're in it, that your response to that is very much what I almost wrote in an email. I, almost, I, I literally hit the reply button, started typing. By the time I got done typing their name, I realized I was about to be a complete jackass. Delete, delete, and delete. Just, yeah, just discard that and walk away for a minute and like recalibrate pandemic, everything that's going on, right? But like if that had happened even last year in person learning, I would have just been like, a, you would need a time machine is what you would need in order to get an A in my class at this point. Um, right. Like I will get you to the finish line, but an A, you gotta be crazy. So part of it's the pandemic and some own personal growth stuff I'm doing it. Part of it is being flexible to the moment in time that we are living in, right? Like we are living through a very dramatic period of our history and a, a student not being able to get motivated enough to get out of bed to do the work that they need to do was a very real thing for a lot of people. And so I took the time, I was like, okay, these are all the things that are going on. I'm not just gonna pass the kid. But I said, all right, here's the deal. You need to show highly proficient work on a number of occasions, or you can't just do it once, or you do part of being highly proficient is being able to consistently be highly proficient, or you can't just do it once and, and call yourself highly proficient or whatever above standard, whatever your 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 language is. Um, so I, I emailed them a list of assignments that they needed to do and told them the scores that they would need to get. Share, you know, the rubrics are here. This is where the assignments are on Canvas. If you need to check in with me one-on-one -on, -one on a Zoom, feel free to do so. But I need all of this stuff. If you want an A, I need all of this stuff by by Friday morning because grades are due on Friday night. Um, did that? I didn't like. I sent that email and I was like, "That's a lot of work. I don't think this kid's going to do all of that." I'm assuming I'm getting an email back about can I get an extension or whatever. Get an email back. Kid asked to have a Zoom meeting. Has three very specific questions about three very specific assignments that they've. Or, it's very clear that they've like already gone through and looked at everything because for whatever reason, I don't know. They had a drink of Red Bull. They listened to Dua Lipa. I don't know. They got motivated. They were ready to go. And instead of closing that door, I stayed open to okay. This kid's ready to learn right now. Friday night at like 4 p.m., this kid turned in everything and all of it was quality work. Nice. And, you know, I have all these triggers for like finding out, did you just copy and paste? Did you, you know, did you, did you cheat? Right. And so I'm, it's very clearly all their own language. I can compare it back to some of the assignments they turned in earlier in the year to like just double check a couple things because I want to make sure that I'm not completely having the wool pulled over my eyes. But kid turned in everything and turned in a work. Kid got an A, right? Like now, what would have happened if I would have just said the original email? Like, dude, you're crazy. You can't, you can't get an A in this class when you're emailing me the week before the quarter's over to ask how to make up basically half of the, or 70% of the class. Like this is not gonna happen. Um, but you know, now the kid was able to show the learning. They did the assignments that I thought were really valuable, right? Like learning the history that slaveholders want us to forget. That reading, really, really valuable, really important. Learning about Mansa Musa, maybe the richest man in the history of the world who was from Africa, a story I never learned until a year and a half ago, really important for that kid to be able to learn that. None of that would have happened if I would have just shut that door down. And then here's the kicker that, that is my favorite part of the story. We're getting started with this quarter. We've got all this weird stuff where we're doing all this training for hybrid. So students are on their own for three days to do work like we've been actively told like you don't have to respond to email you don't need like you don't need to be posting anything like just you, the kids are on their own just post work we created a um an assignment where we, we we picked out some music that was kind of not kind of it was very directly an act of resistance to the institutional race, racism of the united states um and then had three assignments based on those songs that the kids had to do. They had three days to, or technically four days to do them because I had, I had them do an optional Zoom meeting 
kid shows up to the optional Zoom meeting on Tuesday, turns in all the work by Wednesday. Like detailed, really excited, you know, like offered some, like went, did his own research, found some songs that he was interested in that, that he thought were interesting that he thought I should know about that were on the same topic. Kids totally clued into the class. Again, if I had shut him down, what would have happened for this quarter? I probably wouldn't have gotten that engagement. So that that is it's it's one story out of like I did that for you know I did that for eight kids and six of them didn't do anything, but right. you know one of them did enough to to get across the finish line. But again, like if if you go to your default response of I'm not going to be flexible because this person didn't do what I asked them to when I asked them to do it. I don't, I don't know that I would have gotten that work from that kid. And I know that I wouldn't have that engagement with him right now. So that's a, that's a success story of being flexible and a reminder that it's not going to work with every kid, right? There are kids that you're going to be flexible with and they're still not going to, they're still not going to meet it, but when they do, it feels really cool. Right. Right. And I love that you talked about the procrastination to deadline oriented. And I, I think about the false deadlines versus real deadlines and like, mm-hmm. well, okay, no, for real. Like I have to type grades <laughs> into the grade book. Like this is the real deadline, not like the due date I put from a month mm-hmm. ago. Yeah. This is the real deadline. And like, yeah. like there has to be the line. So I love that you shared that in the, both the, the amazing success and then the continued progression as well as the, it's not going to always work that way. So yeah. Appreciate it. Well, we we love you all. Thanks for coming and joining us. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. Always learning at Peak State. Make it a great day.